move the images out. All right, cool. Yeah. Hey, hey, welcome everybody. Thank you for making time. We're really excited to be able to share this. I know some of you have heard about it already. I've probably read about it on our website. Um, I'm really stoked actually. Just before this call, I got off of a call with a counselor at a school in Nicaragua and we've never worked in Nicaragua before. So this program is allowing us to expand our reach and work with schools and students that we otherwise would never get in front of. Um, anyway, so that, I'm, I'm really stoked about that. I'm glad we're doing this now. So we're, we'll spend a little bit of time. We're not going to get into too much of the, uh, uh, the slides itself because I think you've already read it, but we do want to give you an overview, kind of share with you why we created this program, what we want to accomplish with that, more importantly, why you should participate. And then maybe we could chat a little bit about building that award package. We have a couple of uh, uh, people joining us today who've already have done it. And so maybe we can get their insight into it, Jim and Rod. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, students that were um, trying to uh, grab through this effort, talk about selection criteria, the process, the timeline. But really what we want to do is do a lot of conversation in terms of um, what you see the value, how we see this program unfolding uh, over the course of the next few uh, weeks and months. And then uh, we'll stay as long as you need us to talk, uh, talk about all of that. Um, I'm joined by Addy. Um, well, I should maybe introduce myself. I'm assuming everybody knows me. Uh, my name is Girish. I'm the founder and CEO of GenX Education. I'm joined by Addy who's our director of uh, global engagement out of, uh, she lives in Columbus, Ohio, and Ben, our director of partner engagement, who's out of Mississauga in Toronto, Canada. So they'll both be uh, pitching in as well and talking about it. Um, so let me kind of give you an overview of what the program is and why we came up with it. Um, if you work with us in the past, and some of you have, and if you know the work that we do for over a decade now, our focus really has been about enhancing access to global education. We started out in India uh, about uh, 10 years ago, and over the last five years or so, we expanded our effort into the Middle Eastern region. And we work with a consortium of universities that work with us throughout the year, and then our staff spread out across India, work with high schools and students, uh, guiding them, counseling them to find the right fit opportunity. Clearly, we're all just like you stuck at home and not being able to travel. And as we have kind of looked at the landscape of what we need to do now and what we need to do <laughs> during the rest of COVID and post COVID, as we expand our efforts and help you uh, attract the best and the brightest students, um, we started looking at the, the global landscape and not just India and the Middle East especially given that we're all virtual and we can be in, in every part of the world all, all times. Um, but then thinking again about how do we attract top talent to your universities? Obviously each of you uh, has a value proposition for high achieving students around the world and you offer something that each of those students who are a good fit would greatly benefit from. But as you know, your challenge is trying to get in front of as many students and counselors and teachers and principals around the world, which you obviously can do even in normal times, particularly now during COVID times. So as we thought about several different ways we can kind of build an ecosystem around it, we came up with this program <coughs> and as it's designed really to attract high achieving students from across the world. Uh, it's one thing to just say, hey, I'm XYZ University, I have these great programs, and I offer these great scholarships and other experiences on campus, you should look at me. You know, that message only goes so far. So we wanted to kind of add another layer to that and create this program where in collaboration with counselors and teachers and principals at the high schools, ask them to introduce you to their top students. And that's exactly what this program's uh, designed to do. So as we're talking to you about you participating in the program, we've already reached out to counselors around the world, asking them to nominate. And I'm so happy to report that our first nomination actually came from Ecuador. 
again, country I've never been to, and then Costa Rica, and then Brazil and Chile and Nicaragua and Cameroon and Ghana and Morocco. So we're starting to see the nominations roll in and subsequently students applying. So we'll talk to a little bit about how that process works. Um, one other thing that I do wanna highlight is this program obviously is designed to help you get in front of those students, but from a student perspective, what an amazing opportunity for each of these students to be nominated and to be able to consider an opportunity that they otherwise would never maybe explore or never be exposed to. And so this is another really cool opportunity for them. And the fact that counselors and teachers and principals involved, uh, it makes the program very robust. There's a lot of checks and balances in it. It's not a free for all where any student can just apply. We wanna make sure that they have their skin in the game and the counselors really recognize these students for for their work. So to summarize, obviously the benefits of the program for you is that access to a greater diversity of students and counselors cast in a wider net, getting you into places where you may otherwise not be able to go. Make this a really cost-effective recruitment strategy because you don't necessarily have to travel to all these regions. And like I said, really help enhance uh, the, uh, the marketing cap capacity that you have. And for the students, same thing. Access the greater diversity of universities, schools they otherwise will never hear about or consider. And as robust as a Global Scholar Award that you can put together, um, the access to the educational experience that you offer, making it even more affordable. And then there's always this competition appeal. Um, obviously, when we look at students and they, they compete against each other, uh, it's a healthy competition. They're nominated, it's pretty prestigious. Uh, they apply and hopefully every single student that's nominated and applies ends up at a university as a global scholar come fall 21. That's our goal. Um, so that's kind of the whole program right now. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna pass the baton to Addy and have her talk a little bit about building an award package and then uh, maybe uh, I'll call on Rod or Jim who've already done it to maybe talk from an institutional perspective to say, how did you kind of put your package together? So, Eddie? I can't hear you. There we go. There um, go. Yeah, and then we need to backspace just a little bit. So, um, yeah, happy to talk about it. And Girish, of course, Ben, chime in, um, you know, if you have anything to add to this. But, you know, one of the first things that, that we would recommend doing is, you know, when we're thinking about a really competitive merit scholarship, look at what you already have in place at your institution. Um, don't necessarily need to look for new money. Um, I know that there's probably not a whole lot of new money running around your budgets right now, so you probably want to look at what's already there. But what we're really striving for is the most competitive merit scholarship and maybe just a touch above that. If you can meet it or exceed it, that's what we're looking for. And then start thinking about what else you can add on to that because these students are, we're trying to create an award package that would really serve as a launching pad for them. These are top talent. They are um, academically high achieving, but also they're, they're required to demonstrate a record of leadership, engagement in their communities, some sort of service commitment. So these are really well-rounded students who could come to your campuses and do amazing things. And so it's the idea is let's create a package that would support these students and cultivate them to become those campus leaders. So beyond that high merit award, what else could we add to their experience? Um, what other academic, a research opportunity? Maybe it's um, funding to participate in a study abroad or a domestic study experience. Um, are there opportunities for them to get involved in student government? Do you have a student ambassador program they could participate in where they could really stretch those leadership muscles? What about service opportunities? Not everything needs to be um, a guarantee to the student to be part of the package. It can also just be they're eligible to apply to participate in a student ambassador program. I'm gonna pick on my colleagues here from WKU. I know that we have student diplomats um, at, at Western Kentucky University uh, an award, um, a, a Global Scholar Award from WKU, I could envision including an opportunity to apply to participate in 
the, um, the, uh, the student diplomat program at Western Kentucky University. I'm sure many of these other, the other institutions represented here today have those components as well. The other thing I would say is think about it representing your institution. If you are known for undergraduate research, that should be a part of the award. Um, if you're known for your internationalization and your study abroad, obviously right now that's that's not as feasible, but you know, we're looking at a four year career for a student. So down the road, that's definitely something they could pursue. Um, so definitely think about your institutional identity and make sure that that's represented. And then, you know, the other thing is you determine the quantity. Can you offer, can you afford to offer one? Can you offer three? Um, you know, we're gonna talk about this in just a second. Being able to put together three, four, five awards, um, you know, that, that would be ideal. We'd love uh, multiple awards that would definitely attract more students, but do keep in mind that, you know, it's really up to you ultimately how many you end up awarding. If you can piece together three, piece together five, outstanding. But if, if ultimately we present you with 10 students, you've got five awards in place, but only four of those students really fit your criteria, that's your call. You may only want to award four. Um, I feel like I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself there, but Girish, is there anything else you'd want to add to that in terms of building an award package? The only thing I would kind of reiterate or highlight is the fact that this doesn't have to be new, right? It doesn't have to be, oh my God, we got to create all these new opportunities for these students. No, uh, we recognize that many of these components already exist on campus. Maybe you don't assign a faculty mentor to every uh, incoming freshman. That's something that you could probably include in this award because that adds a lot of value to the student. Maybe not every student can automatically be admitted to the honors program, but maybe through this award program, there's a better chance or a higher chance. So there's some kind of a, a ability for you to put them into the honors program. So knowing that many of these components already exist on your campuses, but they're all over the place. So if I was a kid sitting in India or Cameroon, and I research your institution, first find you and then research you, would I be able to find all these opportunities? Maybe, maybe not, because a lot of what I have seen over my years of working is uh, the merit scholarships. Yeah, we talk about honors programs and other things, they're all there, but this award package you know, kind of compels you to bring all of that together, and then we present that to the students, which obviously is very attractive. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Did you want me to, to take the talent? The collection? Yeah, I, mean, I was just yeah. going to say, I mean, I kind of mentioned this earlier, is that, you know, even though our history has been working in India and a few Middle Eastern countries, this has allowed, the COVID times have allowed us to really go global. Uh, some of the work we've been doing the last several weeks in terms of our discovery series sessions has enabled us to attract a global audience and definitely this program has also. So I just wanted to highlight that. But Eddie, please go talk about the rest of it. Yeah, no, and I, and I think we kind of touched on the, the multiple layers to ensure top quality that this is coming through high schools, high school counselors, high school principals who know these students um, best, right? They've been working with them for years. They know, um, they know their backgrounds, they know their performance and they know um, the, the, the quality that they would bring to your institution. So, um, you know, that's the first really, you know, kind of checkpoint for this is that we make sure that, that we, they get the endorsement from their, um, their high school counselor or principal or someone representing their, their high school. Um, and then we're also going to conduct our own vetting process to make sure that the students meet the basic criteria and that they, you know, that they're going to be matching with one or more awards that we have, um, we have together from the, from the different universities participating. So we will do a secondary sweep of all applications to make sure that these really are just top tier students that are, that are coming into your, your pool to evaluate. Um, and we kind of touched on this earlier, but you know, once it's in your hands, once we sort of evaluate the student, determine that they meet basic criteria, we'll conduct a matching process to see which institution they match with. And there was a you set criteria for your award. We will look at our you know, full body of um, global scholars, um, global scholar candidates and determine whose award they match to. And at that point, we would notify you with that list. So hypothetically, you get a list of 10 students. 
you've got five awards that you have committed, and I use the term committed loosely, but that you've put together, you've created five awards, um, you would evaluate those 10 students and determine which of those 10 um, you know, would, would meet your qualifications and be a strong, strong addition to your institution. You make the final decision. Of those five awards, like I said, you may only award four, but then again, you may see in those 10, you may see three more students who are outstanding and decide you can find other scholarships to put together to make an offer to those students. So it, 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 it goes beyond the five awards. It really is attra um, attracting talent to your institution and opening up opportunities, not just for the students, but also for you as well. Um, yeah, and, a good point, yeah. Addy, but yeah, I was just gonna reiterate that. Too. That's a good point because there's this residual value, right? So all of the students that are being nominated, all of the counselors who are participating in it are seeing your brand. They're exploring your institution. Obviously, as they nominate, they're gonna be looking at all the universities participating in the program. Uh, so they're learning more about it. And like Addie said, maybe the top four or five you want to award the Global Scholar Award to, but what about the residual? Uh, the students who do research on your institutions because you're part of the program, they may fall in love with your institution, might want to come to your institution, regardless of whether or not they're one of the chosen Global Scholar students or not. So think about that also as a benefit. And, and as we mentioned, there is no compulsion to offer those awards um, that really, that, that comes down to you and your decision on who's, um, who's going to add the most value to your institution. So, yeah. um, so the, the timeline here just kind of gives you a sense of the timeline we're working with this year. Um, I think, you know, uh, probably next year we would be looking at an earlier start date, but this is the timeline. Thank you, COVID. Um, this is the timeline we're working with this year and a kick, we're obviously in the in the midst of the nomination and application period. Um, so we we are, as Girish said, we're receiving um, quite a few nominations from all over the place, expecting many more. Um, and then with that flow, the the applications. Our application vetting will happen after that. Um, and that'll be done internally. Uh, and then that's when we would make the official selection of our, our global scholars. Um, and provide you all with the global scholars who have matched with your awards. Um, and then it would be in your hands, the students information and materials would be in your hands to evaluate. You would make those selections, identify students um, that you would like to make those awards to. And those students would then be notified and invited to apply to your institutions. So it's a chance for them to take an even closer look. They would have already been doing research on your institution, but to take it even closer. Some of them may have already applied, right? They would have gotten really excited about your institution and probably already submitted their applications. But this would be the time for those others to kind of, who are waiting for additional information to pull the trigger, apply to your institution. Um, and then it, uh, a commitment would need to be made by the students in the springtime. So that is the, the timeline for the Global Scholar Award program this year. Yeah, I just want to just add, right? I mean, obviously, yeah. we're, I feel like we're a little bit behind schedule, but that's kind of what the situation is right now. And we expect next year will be a much more accelerated program or, or timeline. Uh, but right now, like Addy said, we're seeing a lot of nominations coming, and we really want to get as many institutions participating in it so that we can kind of get to the next stage. Uh, and I can't tell you how excited I am uh, about this program. And we really, really hope a great turnout for this year. So I think at, at this point, and yeah. that, I mean, if there's anything else you want to add, I want to leave, leave lots of time for questions. I would imagine for many of our, our attendees, this is their lunch hour, so. Yeah, you know, at this point, actually, Rod, do you mind jumping in and just kind of sharing how you kind of put together your award and what you're kind of looking at. I think that might help the rest of them. You're muted, I think, Rod. Sorry. Well, um, through the conversations that I've had with um, Garish and Addie, I've been trying to work with existing um, awards that we have. And 
allowing those existing awards to sort of attract um, some of these global scholars that I'm hoping that will come in. Um, we, I have not gotten any new money. Like anybody else, everybody else, and Addie mentioned earlier, um, this is a time that we're actually, um, our belts are being tightened for us. And so working with existing money is imperative. Um, what I have done is um, sort of shifted or renamed a couple of existing scholarships um, to fit um, this particular um, endeavor. Um, I have um, earmarked a certain amount of um, the scholarships that are already in place for this group to consider this group for. Um, so there's no new money involved. It's just the renaming or moving around of existing scholarships. And I'm pretty sure that um, just thinking about the students that are involved, having seen um, the beginnings of this program, um, starting from working with um, Garish and um, Next and Gen Next um, during tours and seeing this actual uh, program start and seeing it in action, I'm pretty excited about some of the students that will be involved. Thank you, Rod. Appreciate that. No um, yeah, I don't know if Jim wants to add anything about the award he kind of put together. Yeah, I mean, Rod said it well, and, and Addie did as well in terms of really looking at um, what you offer on your campus uh, that might be attractive to a student of this caliber. Um, I kind of, when I looked at our scholarship money, I just basically said, well, I have a range of money to offer. And so based on the assumed quality of student that I would be reviewing, um, I just committed to offering um, global scholars the top end of the range automatically rather than being a maybe. Um, and then other applicants who aren't maybe uh, those chosen to receive the top end could still get our normal amount, which would be maybe $5,000 less. Um, uh, also, you know, we do have a, it's not really an honors program. It's a specialized scholar program for international and, and multicultural. It's a multicultural awareness um, program, um, both international and domestic. And so it's called the Phelps Scholar Program. And so we would, we would really uh, want the students to participate in that it wouldn't be mandatory. We wouldn't force them to, but we would highly encourage them to. Um, and then uh, um, we do assign them as many colleges do with a faculty advisor immediately. Uh, yeah, and then I'm starting more of a, a more active um, kind of global ambassador type program. So they would be um, a kind of uh, unless they chose to to not be involved we would we would want them and encourage them to be involved in that as well so you know as Addie said it's kind of like some of these things are kind of invitations to do this um, as opposed to you know being kind of force-fed but I think the more opportunities you give them um, including like was mentioned earlier with uh, research and potentially internships and things like that. But I think especially if they're in STEM, they want to know that they, you know, have access to the research facility. So, um, yeah, I think it was, it was totally pulling together stuff that we already do, um, that we already offer, uh, that students kind of already take a look at by putting it into one package to make, uh, make it look attractive to, to these students. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's any questions from the others as you're considering participating in the program. So we'll just open it up. Anybody who wants to chime in. I think all your mics are activated. Hey, Hello, this is, oh, sorry, go oh. ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Uh, how's everyone doing? Hey, Gersh. Um, and uh, uh, Jim, were you, I think you and I were actually on um, the EdUSA conversation with um, with our colleagues uh, a couple of weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you're from Hope uh, University, right? Hope College, yep. yep. Hope College, yeah. Okay, great, yeah. It's good to see you again. Good to see you again. Um, just a quick question, Gersh, um, and Addie. Um, 
uh, you were mentioning the diversity that you've been getting. Um, what's the what's the outreach um, uh, that you're utilizing to do that? I know uh, the virtual space has given us a lot of access, but how are you going about um, working in these other areas, different markets outside of um, South Asia uh, and the Middle East, where you've been doing a lot of work recently? Yeah, you know, we reached out to counselors and we've been gathering data, I guess, databases of counselors in schools and contact information. So we've been campaigning them to participate in it. And that's kind of how it started um, as we started the hearing. And one thing that I found just in the last couple of weeks or so, our counselors who kind of sort of knew who we were, but hadn't really worked with us, but heard of Gen X, but then they explored what the program was and them WhatsApping their counselor groups and letting them know that there's this program. And that's how it's kind of grown. So it's been very organic. Uh, and we've reached out to people. I haven't made very many major announcements on you know, the International ACAC Facebook page or College Admissions Counselors page yet, which I will. But so far, it looks like organically, it's kind of been uh, word of mouth that counselors are hearing about it. But at the same time, we have a database of about 8,500 counselors across the world. And so we've reached out to them through a couple of different campaigns, email campaigns. So that's kind of how it started. Okay, great, yeah. thanks for that. Yeah, and so a couple of them actually reached out to us and we wanna hear more about it. And so we've had a couple of one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls counselor and like I said this morning with Nicaragua uh, we had a couple of email exchanges with other counselors we did another one with a counselor in Morocco they were just curious right they're like wondering what what this is all about what they can do um, one thing that I spoke about this morning the counselor was so excited she was worried that her school would have to pay to participate or her students would have to pay a fee obviously we're not charging the schools or the students any money so I think that was another to her she felt really relieved about that that's what she said this morning Thank you. Somebody else was chiming in. It was Amy. Yes. Amy. This is Amy from Western Kentucky University. It's so good to see Addie in her new position. Uh, but thank you for this information today. It's really, I think, a creative concept. Uh, I was just wondering how many institutions in the United States are currently participating in this? And then also, what is the cost uh, to the university? <laughs> sure. I mean, right now, we've only had apart from all of our partner institutions, which George Mason is one of them, waiting for them to commit to awards, uh, there have been, uh, all of our partner universities have, and like I mentioned earlier, Rod has and Jim has, uh, they're non-partners as we call them, who are participating in it. And we're hoping not just for American institutions, to be honest with you, uh, we're looking at institutions from around the world. We've had conversations with schools in New Zealand. Alana here, even though she's in Michigan, she actually represents a, a school from the UK. And we've had schools from France, um, schools from Canada. So we really wanna make this a global program for global students being able to go everywhere else, everywhere they wanna go. And so that's kind of how we're positioning it. If you're a partner institution, this program is part of the partnership, so you know, there's no additional cost. If you're a non-partner, we're just asking for an annual fee of $2,500 to participate in it so that we can cover all of the administrative and the marketing and the outreach costs to the program. Um, and be besides that, there won't be any additional cost to you. Uh, you don't have to pay us per student. Uh, whoever comes to your campus, they come and we just want to make sure that we drive your international recruitment efforts to new heights and, and expose you to areas that you might otherwise never be able to get to. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, this is Aaron Bixler at Miami University in Oxford. I'm sorry if I missed this earlier. I was trying to watch the Cincinnati Reds playoff game at the same time. <laughs> it only happens <laughs> once every other year. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the, the expectation in terms of, the, you know, you're talking about cobbling existing money together, which we can certainly is a viable option. What's the kind of expectation on the scholarship level? Like, is it thinking about like a full tuition award or are you talking including housing, food, other things like that? Is there an expectation there? Uh, no expectation. 
it's just that we want you to do the best you can. But like Addie has said and others have chimed in, it's, it's tough times right now. We can't expect you to offer a full ride. Uh, I'm sure every student who applies or nominated and, and wants to go through this would love to get a full ride. Uh, but if you can't, you can't, right? If you can offer a significant amount of the tuition and fees as a scholarship, and then they would have to cover a small percentage of that and housing room and board, then that's one of the criteria, right? Uh, as you complete the form to commit your award, you'll have lots of questions to answer. And one of those questions is, what will be the total out-of-pocket expense for a student per year? Yeah. At the same time, we're also saying, hey, could you employ this person? Like one of the schools that committed an award, they said, every global scholar that we recruit will get a job in our office and they'll be paid $10 an hour, right? So that's kind of already in there. Whether or not the student will do the work or they want to do it, that's secondary. But as they consider it, they know if they are chosen for the award and if they go to that institution, there's the scholarship piece, but they also know they have a little bit of earning capacity because they've been offered a job as part of the award, right? So maybe that will... <laughs> help them cover the, the cost a little bit more than otherwise, right? So we ask you to do the best you can, bring together as many components of this, and it's not just a financial scholarship. We want it to be about the total experience of being at your institution. Okay, great, thanks, that helps a lot. Yeah, hope they're winning. It just, <laughs> it's still tied, just started. Anyone else? Alana, Carrie, Tanuja, Vinita? No. Okay. Well, uh, we don't want to keep everybody on. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Oh. Uh, sorry for joining late. Uh, okay. I'm Dr. Tanuja Dupe uh, from JSPM Rajesh College of Engineering, Pune. Okay. Uh, so because of some internet issue, I joined the meeting late. Uh, okay. So some of the point or I think most of the point I have missed. But uh, to be very frank, uh, we are having nearly two years association with uh, Generation Next Education. Miss uh, Sheila and her team, uh, they are uh, coming regularly for giving the higher education talks. And uh, since in the last year, only we are autonomous one. So okay. since we are uh, uh, autonomous one, so in this uh, year, we are started for the student exchange programs for our students. Now, since total, we are having total... Uh, seven campuses and our campus is the first campus uh, who is autonomous one okay. and uh, as the years goes on our remaining campuses they will be again going for the autonomy so my okay. question is that during this covid 19 pandemic how the students they will be uh, going for the higher educations and is there any flexibility will be given for our students uh, so that for the first year of their master's program, the mm -hmm. students will be uh, going for the online and then uh, from the second year, they will be uh, uh, actually uh, uh, learning uh, at the university. So what kind of provisions will be there uh, during this COVID pandemic and uh, any concession in the scholarship will be given or it depends on the as and when the scholarships will be announced and then the students can open for the for that call for proposal. Sure. Well, thank you for joining us and thank you for collaborating with Sheila and the team on the grad side. A um, couple of things I just want to uh, at the outset say that this program is geared for undergraduate students coming in from high schools to start an undergraduate course of degree. So this isn't for college students from anywhere to come for a graduate education. Okay. Uh, but having said that, even if uh, in terms of the COVID uh, situation and how we accommodate students as as a currently are being accommodated, right? There are a lot of students internationally who are uh, 
enrolled in colleges, but unfortunately cannot travel to the U.S. for one reason or another, and they continue to take courses remotely. And hopefully by August of 2021, when the new school year starts, we'll be back to normal, cross fingers, and allow students to come actually and participate in an on-campus experience. But in the event that a student is selected as a global scholar and has been admitted to an institution and come August 21, they're still not able to travel, I would imagine that the scholarship will still hold the experience will be maybe a little bit delayed in terms of an on-campus one, but in terms of the student's ability to participate in all of the academic components of it will still continue. So that's kind of what my perspective is. I don't know if any of the universities want to pitch in and talk about what would happen if COVID continues through fall of 21 and if there's global scholars, but I think I'm confident to say that if a student has been admitted and has been awarded a scholarship, those scholarships, as they do now in this current year, will still be uh, viable and it will still be extended. Uh, it's just that the student might not be able to come study here. Uh, but in, in, in response to some of your other questions, uh, Dr. Dope, maybe we could connect offline and chat a little bit more about how we can help your graduate side of things. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, coordinate with Sheila to maybe have a call for all of us to um, get on another Zoom call at another time. Uh, okay, thanks a lot for sharing. Yeah, my pleasure. Day. Yes, absolutely. Yes, thanks yes. for joining so, us. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else, anybody? Okay. Well, if no questions, thank you for joining us. Uh, again, you'll see the website listed on there, uh, gennext.me slash global scholar. Uh, be careful with the uh, uh, capitalization there. It's a case sensitive website. Or you can always reach out to us at global scholar at gennextseducation.com or you know where to get a hold of us with our email. So uh, really look forward to having you participate in it. Uh, please. Uh, think about putting together an award, even if it's just one. Uh, we really want to get these high achieving students an opportunity to come study at your institution. So uh, thank you. Uh, and I'll, I'll keep it open if anybody else wants to add to it or comment on it. Um, but if not, thank you again for joining us. Anything, Addie or Ben, you want to add? No. Um, no. Thanks again. Great questions. And please don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah. Anything else, Matt? No, just thanks for having us. Uh, it was good to kind of hear again um, in with some new kind of contexts and ideas um, about particularly the package I thought was really helpful. So thanks for uh, explaining that, Addy, as well. Awesome. And, uh, other ways that we can put that together. No, I think we're looking forward to it. Um, we've talked with folks on our side, Megan, uh, in particular, uh, about how we, we get involved in this. Um, and, uh, and yeah, how do we deeper our relationship with Gen X, which is something I'll respond to your recent email as well. Uh, thanks, here, Looking forward to Sounds that. Good. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Well, thank you all. Have a great day and stay safe. And uh, Aaron, go, go twins. Red, right? Go, go twins. <laughs> 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 we'll be watching. We'll be, I don't know how much it's going to get done.